This evening's sponsor is the Muskegon County VFW Council. Would the VFW Council members in attendance please stand and be recognized? Thank you. It's the tribute of many of the veterans organizations and individual donors that help us do this collaboration. As you know, this course is a collaborative course between the two museums, the USS Silverside Submarine Museum, the LST 393 Veterans Museum, and Muskegon Community College. Without the support of any of those entities, we wouldn't be able to do this class. And it's you, the community, that has been a great driver for this program. A year ago, we put this program on. We expected maybe a class of 25 students and maybe 30 or 40 community residents who might be interested in World War II joining us. Of course, many of you were here. First night, we had 125, 130. And every night after that, it built up until the last evening where we had 350 people in here. So this is quite a testimony for your desire as a community to learn, to honor, and to respect the achievements of the world's greatest generation. Now, I do want to convey some bad news. Um, one of our presenters last year, maybe some of you remember him, his name was Albert Flickema. Mr. Flickema was a D-Day veteran. And he gave his presentation rather reluctantly. He didn't want to talk about his service. But when we got him up, he talked. And he shared his efforts on Omaha Beach. Mr. Flickema died this past December. So if we could just put a, a second together here to remember him. So let's give a moment of silence for Mr. Flickema. This was one of his proudest moments. Uh, in fact, in his obituary, he mentioned that he was a presenter at the USS Silversides in this college lecture program. And if, is there any members of his family present? I know that they attended last year. There was three generations of the Flickema family here. No? Okay. Well, may you rest eternally. He's kind of smiling down at us today. Okay, so what is this? This is experiential learning. This is a class which is designed for people to understand that we not only take history, but we put a living component to it. We are sharing the stories that accompany lectures. And we're fortunate that the people still remain from this period. And last year, we integrated veteran stories as part of this process, and it really, really worked well. And we're hoping to do more of that this year. In addition to that, we are going to have a national and international effort because we're bringing in guest speakers, people that are authorities in their particular aspect about World War II, not only the military components, but the social, the economic, and other components to discuss their perspectives. As part of that, as part of our lecture series this week, or this, I'm sorry, this year, we will be having people represented from the Holocaust Center. Martin Lowenberg, who is a Holocaust survivor, will be one of our speakers who will talk about his internment in one of the death camps. We will have Dr. Katrina von Kellenbach, who is a professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Her story is very compelling because as a young girl, she found out that her uncle was responsible for the death of 35,000 Jews in the concentration camp. And how that impacted, knowing that an uncle you love, who you think is a very decent man, also had this dichotomy as a person that probably was responsible for death. And she will share her story. We will also be joined by David, Stay, uh, David Stahill. Dr. David Stahill is a professor who is the preeminent historian on the Eastern Front. He has devoted many years of his life 
studying the German participation in World War II. He has written three seminal books, Operation Typhoon, Moscow, and Kiev, and he's working on a fourth book. He is in Australia. He's at the equivalent of their West Point, which is the University of New South Wales, Australia. He will be joining us live by Skype. It'll be 8 o'clock his time when he's Skyping in and talking to us here. And he is a very riveting speaker, great historian. You'll be very interested to hear what his perspective is on the Eastern Front. Now, we also will have other speakers throughout the semester, 25 different people, all sharing their stories and perspectives. A comprehensive list is available if you want to pick up the guide. I think there's some guides back in the back here. But tonight is the only night that you can come for free. We want to continue to further this. And the way we're going to do that is you'll need to become either a member of the museum or join our class. Or if you can't make all of them, you can pay a $5 a la carte fee at the door. And I'll have Frank Marzak talk about that later. But we have to keep the lights on, the heat going. The staff has to be paid here at the museum. The professors still need their money from the poor students, and it's still a student class. So we have to do these things. But, you know, I kind of waited out. For less than a cup of coffee that you pay out at a restaurant or a cafe, you could be here. So it's very economical. We are who we were. We have to know our past to understand our future, and it's very important that we have that perspective. And that's what our series will do. Um, we'll teach our students by honoring our veterans. And this was just a couple of examples. We have Paul Kidd on the right, who was talking about the service his brother gave as a staff sergeant. He died during World War II, a highly uh, decorated man who was, a, I believe, a sniper, Paul, was that correct? One of his jobs. One of his jobs, sniper. Uh, his medals, Paul was explaining to the class his brother's legacy. Then we had Don Morell, who is a World War II submariner, who read a very eloquent poem and talked about the, the submariner's experience. Those are the sorts of things you're going to get in more this semester, quite a few more. So you want to be here every week and be involved. Again, this is a partnership. It's the one of the only ones that I know of, of this type. So it's really kind of a special thing. So let's proceed forward. Welcome to our class. Welcome to the discovery of World War II for winter semester 2014. Now, here we have to do a little background on this evening's subject. It is imperative we understand a little bit about this battle. I want to set the, the, the perspective here. This campaign we're talking about tonight occurred in October of 1942, or 40, uh, yeah, 42. But we need to have a perspective of what is going on that is driving this initiative. And what you need to understand is Pearl Harbor had been attacked in December of 1941, December 7th. Our fleet suffered a tremendous loss, really handicapped us. And that's going to be part of the perspective that you have to remember. We are going to be limited in our ability to respond to our enemy. At the same time, Japan is attacking the Philippines. And it's not going well. We cannot respond. Not well enough. And a decision is made to withdraw General MacArthur in December of 1941. Against his wishes, he is forced by Roosevelt to leave leaves General Rainwright with the bad. Take care of things, I will be back. 
He assumes that there's going to be some sort of a measured response that he'll be able to return quickly to the Philippines. He barely escapes by the skin of his teeth. And if you pick up our author's book tonight, he has a very great chapter about it, how it, that all unfolds. Now, the Philippine Islands fall ultimately May 42. They're down. Japan has also been working at invading other places along the Pacific. They have invaded Burma, the Dutch East Indies, Singapore, Hong Kong, among others. Things are starting to look very dim. Every place the Japanese take, it's going to make it more and more difficult for the United States and their allies to respond. Remember that many of these places that they're taking are British colonies, French colonies, Dutch colonies. Many of them are very instrumental to the war effort. The loss of rubber is going to be very, very important to the war effort, really handicapping us and our allies and will require a response eventually that we'll have to make synthetic tires. Thank God we do because it's really changed automobiles today, but that's another aside. And the focus is going to be on Australia. Australia is going to become the launching pad. But the problem is Australia has got a little problem. It sent its boys away. They're fighting over in Europe and Africa. And now the Japanese are encroaching on their doorstep because they have now taken over Rabaul and have invaded New Guinea. And they're within 300 miles of northern Australia with the potential of cutting off the shipping lanes and taking and hand hindering Australia. And in fact, Australia is beside itself. It thinks it's going to be invaded. Their prime minister orders or asks Churchill to release the troops, send them back home, send two of his divisions back home to help with defense. And part of the negotiation that you will find out involved the fact that they couldn't bring the third division home. And the third division was going to be backfilled by men from Mus Muskegon, Escanaba, Grand Rapids, and other places, the 32nd Infantry Division, which has been federalized, trained, and now sent to Australia as one of the first units on the scene. And we're going to talk more extensively tonight about how this all happens. Let me show you the extent of this process here. This is where the, the red areas are the Japanese areas. This is what Japan has taken over, folks. You look, that, that's a very wide spreading circle. If you're going to attempt to come back, the only place you're going to do it is down here in Australia. That's the only place left. Because these other islands are so small, you can't mass troops up. And you're going to need many ships to get them out and start to be able to do an island hopping campaign of some nature. So this is part of what we're going to be examining. So tonight's focus is going to be on the Red Arrow Division, the 32nd Infantry, the exploits of citizen soldiers, many of which joined the military, not because of great fervor and patriotism when they joined, because they had to, because they had to feed families. And we'll talk to Stanley, he had six siblings at home, and he had to be the, the main source of money for those folks. And many of the others needed a paycheck, too, because we were suffering from the Great Depression all the way through the late 30s, early 40s. So when they were in the National Guard, it was another 
15 bucks, 20 bucks, maybe home a month. Well, that, that went a long way back in those depression days. So this was something to consider. Now, what we're going to examine is this maneuver, this strategy that MacArthur employed because he sent these guys to New Guinea to attack the Japanese. They, the, the island was half divided between Japanese and was being held on to by the Australians. They held on to a place called Port Moresby. And he was going to dispatch the 32nd Infantry Division on a 120-mile maneuver through swamps, through jungles, over a range of mountains that are 10,000 feet tall. They start out in wool uniforms, ill-prepared, and then they're expected after doing this to attack the Japanese who have emplacements all the time as they're moving, suffering. And it's going to be this journey, this escapade that we're going to look at today. Because this march start, starts on October 12, 1942, and two-thirds of the unit, before, by the time they reach the end of the trail, is suffering from all sorts of maladies, tropical fevers, trench foot, other things. And then when they get to the other side, they're going to be fighting in waist-deep to shoulder-deep water because there's not a dry place for them to be able to launch an offensive. No tanks, no artillery pieces because the jungle and the terrain are so devastating that they can't get through. And all the time, General MacArthur is impatient. Why aren't they breaking through? Okay, so I got the high sign, I have to move on here. <laughs> Let me introduce our speaker. We are blessed to have today James Campbell. James is a writer, he's a native of Wisconsin, has three daughters, he's received his education at Yale University, his bachelor's, and a master's of arts from Colorado, University of Colorado. He's a writer by vocation. It was written for Outside Magazine, National Geographic, and uh, a number of other publications. And he's also written a number of books. The book we're talking about tonight is The Ghost Mountain Boys. But he's also written other books, outdoor books, as well as other military books. The Final Frontiersman, uh, a story of Hemo Korth and his family up in Arctic, above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. We have the Ghost Mountain Boys, which we're talking about tonight, and his most recent book is The Color of War, How One Battle Broke Japan and Another Changed America, which outlines the service of African-American troops at a place called Port Chicago, which is outside of uh, Oakland, California. It was a place where they loaded munitions. And there was a tragic mishap because the munitions were mishandled. And there was a, the, the, the munitions dump blew up. The size of the explosion was greater than the atomic bomb. And they wanted to court-martial these guys who were not trained very well, subject to occupational hazards, and it really is kind of a, a tragic story. So you might want to pick up that book as well, and maybe James will have a minute to talk about it. So please welcome uh, Mr. Campbell to us. But before we do so, we want to introduce, we have with us tonight, uh, a number of the gentlemen from the Ghost Mountain Boys, our contingent of Muskegon veterans that are highlighted as part of this book. So gentlemen, when I call your name, just raise your hand. Carl Stenberg, Stanley Yastrzemski, Russell Byes, 
and Robert Lovell. Okay. Without further ado, let me bring up Mr. Campbell. You've heard enough from me tonight. There you go, Jim. Okay, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking George for that kind introduction and for the additional PR. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to see you all. I had no idea we'd have this many people. Um, I, it's, a, it's a stunning, I think, um, uh, authentication of what they're trying to do here, and I'm very happy to be part of it. But most of all, I am overjoyed and honored that these men uh, were able to come out tonight. So I'd like everybody to give them a hand one more time. <clears throat> okay, people have also often asked me why I wrote this book. Um, it was, in, in many ways, a labor of love, a labor of love that dates back, in some ways, in some cases, to 1989. Um, uh, my brother and I had grown up on National Geographic specials, and we always wanted to be explorers. And in 1989, I was working in Chicago, and my brother had just graduated from college, and we had always wanted to go on a great adventure. We were going to build a raft and float down the Amazon or go to deepest, darkest Africa or go to New Guinea. And the place that occupied our imaginations more than any other was the island of New Guinea. So we decided if we didn't do it then, we were never going to do it. So I quit my job. We packed our backpacks and we went to New Guinea for six months. We climbed the highest mountain on the island of New Guinea, Mount Wilhelm, which is over 16,000 feet. We waded through tangled jungles and we canoed rivers. We canoed, one of the famous rivers we canoed was a place called the Sepik River, which is uh, New Guinea's kind of heart of darkness river. And we canoe 20 miles, 30 miles a day, and then we tie off at these villages in the evening. And many of these people had seen maybe a missionary, maybe an anthropologist. And we came into their villages and we'd be surrounded by people with nine foot pig spears and bayonets. And we'd heard about these people, we, you know, we'd heard that they were cannibals and that they were headhunters, so we were terrified. And we didn't know what to make of it, we thought we'd end up in a pot of stew or something. And all of a sudden the kids would dash out and they'd touch our skin and then they'd dash back into the crowds and then we were welcomed and they, they, we had huge celebrations and we ate and sang and danced with them all night. And it was one of the greatest, greatest um, adventures and experiences of my life and I vowed then and there that I was going to go back. In 1995 I got married and my wife is a bit of an adventurer and we decided we were going to sell most of our possessions and we were going to travel until we ran out of money. We were literally going to go for broke. In one of the places I took her for my honeymoon, for our honeymoon, was the island of New Guinea. Of course, any, any soldier who served on the island of New Guinea thinks that's pure madness. They thought I was, when I told them that, they thought I was the craziest man in the world. And at the time, I did too. We, were, we spent two weeks on the coast, and then we went into the highlands. And we spent another two weeks, and in the highlands, my wife got malaria. We were, we were probably 20 miles from the nearest road. We were way in the mountains, and she had a 104.5 degree fever. And I was terrified. I thought, what have, what have, I, gotten, what have, what have I gotten us into? And um, ultimately, what we did is we managed to get out of the mountains. We managed to take an old potato truck that we sat in the back, in the bed of it. And we managed to, I managed to get her out of the mountains to the coast and onto a ship. Um, and we ultimately ended up on the island of Ternate, which some of you might recognize is also an island of World War II fame. We, I found the only doctor on the island and he pumped her full of chloroquine. And huge, huge doses of chloroquine. At the time we were taking larium, which this Center for Disease Control said, if we took that, there'd be absolutely no possible way any of us would ever get malaria. So what ultimately happened was the chloroquine killed the parasite inside her liver and also killed all of her hair. Her hair was coming out in tufts. 
So as bad as the malaria was, she was even more upset about her hair falling out. So the one question everybody asks me when I tell that story is, are you still married? Did your wife stick with you? And I'm happy to say, yes, she did. She did stick with me miraculously. But um, the, the only reason I tell that story is because in 1989, for the first time, I realized that there was a war on the island of New Guinea. And in 1995, I realized for the first time that that war had been fought by the 32nd Division, the Red Arrow Men. And now I'd grown up in small town Wisconsin, and I watched these men march in parades, and I didn't know their story, and I was ashamed of myself. Uh, it turns out that a man who lived just three doors down from where I grew up uh, served on the island of New Guinea with the Red Arrow Division and never uttered a word about it. But of course, men of that generation didn't talk about that. James Bradley has a great quote in his book about why the men didn't talk about their experiences. And one of his characters said, we came home and we got on with living. And that's exactly what happened. So this man, this man Yvette, gradually told me some of his stories. And I realized that I was fascinated with it. So I began kind of a slow study of World War II on the island of New Guinea. And in 2004, when I finished my first book, I was looking for another book to write. This is how, this is how I pay, pay the mortgage. This is how we pay our bills. I am a working writer. So my wife came into my office as I was laboring over ideas, and she said, you know, you idiot. The book is staring you in the face. You've been obsessed and preoccupied with this war on the island of New Guinea since I met you. That's the book you have to write. And I realized that she was right. And that's the book I, I set out to write. My first meeting with the 32nd Division was at a 32nd Division Old Timers meeting in Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. It was held in June, late June of 2005. It was a hot, hot summer. And I walked into the barracks and all the men were gathered there, and I chose a bunk, and they introduced themselves. And at the end of the barracks, they had huge fans on either end of the barracks. At the end of the barracks, there was a group of veterans talking. And I kind of eavesdropped. I was sitting on the edge of my bunk. And they were talking about their ailments, their physical ailments. They were in their late 90s, in their, excuse me, their late 80s to early mid 90s. And one man had recently been in a wheelchair. Uh, confined to a wheelchair and he'd lost all the feeling in his legs. Another one had just had a quadruple bypass and another guy had just had a stroke. And the final man there, who was the oldest of the group, he was 95 years old, a guy named Bob with big Coke bottle glasses, very, very thin. He said, they said, well, Bob, how have you been? He said, well, the last year has been really miserable. I've had a lot of, lot of health problems. And he said, but you know what? When I leave this world and I go to meet my maker, I don't want to go of a stroke, I don't want to go of a heart attack, and I don't want to go of old age. So the other guy said, well, Bob, how do you want to go? And I should say that Bob fancied himself kind of a ladies' man. So Bob said, when I leave this world, I want to be shot by an angry husband. <laughs> so. So I realized that these guys were going to be a kick in the pants and a whole lot of fun. So I spent five days with them. I listened to their polka music. I drank beer with them. I played cards, cards with them, and I listened to their stories. And it was one of the great experiences of my life. And gradually, they became my friends. I talked, to them, talked with them, and I interviewed them. And I asked, I said, can you refer me to some more veterans? And they said, sure. So ultimately, I ended up calling Russell Bynes. And Russ, and I said, Russ, you know, can you help me out with this story? I've just been back from the, I've just been to the National Archives. And I'd like, I, I want to know about these men who marched over the mountains. And he said, well, a bunch of them are here, live right here in Muskegon. And if you're willing to come over, I'll get, you know, I'll organize a gathering and I'll get them all collected in, our, in my living room. So I got there and I started hearing these stories and a light went on in my head. I thought, ah, fine, hallelujah, this is the way into the story. Prior to that, I thought, I'm going to write about the 32nd Division on the island of New Guinea and I'm going to write a 3,000 page book 
that nobody in his or her right mind will ever read. And I thought, this is the way I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to tell the story of these men who went over the mountains. And I don't know what you know about the island of New Guinea or the war there, but it was the worst place in the world to fight a war, as George said. MacArthur's chief engineering officer called it the ultimate nightmare country. And he said that the 32nd Division, the US Army, would face challenges without precedent on the island of New Guinea. And sadly, the island of New Guinea proved him correct. Um, each and every soldier who fought there suffered monumentally, but nobody suffered more than these gentlemen right here. Uh, as George said, uh, General MacArthur, in all his hubris and um, impatience, ordered these men to make a 130-mile march across some of the most rugged terrain in the world. And I don't know if you know what the Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea is, but New Guinea is the second largest island in the world. It sits just above Australia, in the pot, and it's shaped like a prehistoric bird or a prehistoric dragon. And the tail that hangs down just above Australia is called the Papuan Peninsula. And the Papuan Peninsula is made up of malarial swamps, tangled jungles, and mountains that in some cases are unmapped even today. And those are the mountains that these men had to go over. And when they reached the north coast and went directly into battle, they were physically shattered by the experience. So what I've tried to do with this book is I've tried to tell the story of not only their suffering, but ultimately their heroism too. And I've tried to write what I hope is not so much military history or a war story, but de a deeply personal soldier's story. And to do that, I interviewed over 60 veterans of the campaign. Um, and interspersed throughout the book are their, their stories, their diary entries, and their letters. In fact, I begin the book with the letters of the division surgeon, Major Simon Warmanhoven from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the reason I do that is because Major Warmanhoven was a bit of a poet. And I think all his letters very painfully and beautifully uh, um, elucidate and reflect the, the heartache and the longing that all of these men must have felt. So what, what I'll do today is after that not so brief introduction, I'll tell you a little bit, of, I'll give you a summary of the book, and then what we're going to do is we're going to show um, a nine minute reel that we put together quite some time ago for a documentary film that we are still working on. So I'm going to make a shameless appeal right now. We have been work, trying to get this documentary going for four years. So if any of you know anybody with deep pockets who is willing to, to, to fund a very, very worthwhile film, please refer them to me. So, uh, so we'll show you the nine minute trailer to the film that we are continuing to work on, and then I will attempt to answer some questions, and most importantly, these gentlemen will attempt to answer your question. I'd like to say that I always feel a little bit sheepish talking about the war on the island of New Guinea in front of men who actually fought the war. I wrote the book, they fought the war, and of course, you know, that makes, that makes all the difference. So, um, so just to begin with, just some just quick history. Um, prior to World War II, as George said, the 32nd Red Arrow Division was a loosely organized National Guard unit made up of mostly of men from Wisconsin and Michigan. When the National Guard was federalized in October of 1940, these men, much to their chagrin, realized that they were in for the duration. And they were sent to the Deep South, which most, I don't think any of them had, had ever been there before. They were sent to a place called Camp Beauregard, which with typical GI humor they called Camp Disregard. And there they trained with broom handles for rifles and sticks for bayonets. And the, 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 the training was um, unnecessary and didn't in any way prepare, themselves, prepare the men for what they were going to confront on the island of New Guinea. 
Shortly after Pearl Harbor, they were sent to another place in Louisiana uh, called Livingston, Louisiana for, for maneuvers. They participate in the largest peacetime war maneuvers in US history called the Louisiana Maneuvers. But while they were there, they trained in modern, mechanized, mobile war warfare, the kind of warfare that was being fought on the European front. Of course, at that point, they had no indication they were going to go anywhere else. One of the characters in my book wrote in his memoirs later, the swamps of Louisiana were so available, but we did not train in them had we only known. Of course, they didn't know. Not, not long after the Louisiana maneuvers, they were sent north to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, um, where they thought, they thought that would be their last stopover before being sent to the European front. Their engineering unit had already been sent to Northern Ireland, so they were certain that that's where they were going to end up. Well, that's not where they ended up. They were loaded onto trains, sent clear across the United States to San Francisco, California, where they were loaded onto ships and sent out to who knows where. They speculated where they were going. They thought, some thought they were going to Samoa. Some thought they were going to Hawaii. Some thought they were going to the Aleutian Islands. Well, where they ended up was a place called Adelaide, Australia, in South Australia. They were supposed to go to Brisbane, but the battle for the Coral Sea was going on at the time, and they were rerouted to Adelaide. Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Adelaide, Australia, but Adelaide is not the place to begin jungle training for the island of New Guinea. About two months after they landed in Adelaide, the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula. And when MacArthur got news that the Japanese had made that invasion, he was beside himself. Uh, he had just unleashed a plan called Operation Providence in which he was going to send these men, the men of the 32nd Division, by ship around the Papuan Peninsula to occupy the land the Japanese had just invaded. Nevertheless, MacArthur and his advisors comforted him, themselves with the fact, well, with the idea that the Japanese would never be mad enough to attempt an, an overland invasion of Port Moresby, the Allied base on the south coast of the Papuan Peninsula. And as George said, that's not only what the Japanese intended to do, it's exactly what they did do. And on September 15th, they, they reached a place called Yorubaya Ridge, which is 30 miles north of Port Moresby, and they were getting ready to attack the Allied base. Um, at that point, General MacArthur realized that he would have to very quickly mobilize the 32nd Division. By this time, the 32nd Division had made it from Adelaide, Australia, to Brisbane, Australia, to a place called Camp Tambourine, which was later named Camp Cable. When they got there, they were supposed to begin their jungle training and their jungle combat training. But what they realized when they got there, they realized that they had to literally build this camp from scratch. So when they should have been doing river crossings and doing compass exercises, they were putting up tents and digging latrines. Nevertheless, General MacArthur mobilized them, and they were called the guinea pigs of the South Pacific with good reason. They were sent to New Guinea with World War I leggings. Most of them were sent without any quinine to one of the most malarial places in the world. The first unit that went over was a Big Rapids, Michigan unit, Company E. And one of the characters in my book arrived in New Guinea on September 15th and wrote in his diary, September 15th, 5.30 p.m., temperature 115 degrees, New Guinea weather is hotter than the lower story of hell. <laughs> Company E, along with an African-American engineering unit, built a road, hacked a road from Port Moresby to a place called Gaba Gaba. The, the natives called it Gaba Gaba. The 2nd, 32nd Division called it Kappa Kappa. And while he did that, while, while they did that, General MacArthur came up with this half-mad plan to send the 32nd Division over the mountains 
of the Papuan Peninsula. And the Australians warned them against it. The Papua New Guinea or New Guinea had been an Australian colony since 1906. And the Australian generals said, don't attempt it, don't try it, it's madness. The mountains are too high, the rivers are too fast, the terrain is too rugged, and the natives may be hostile. But as George said, MacArthur was full of impatience. He wanted to record the first victory, the first land victory of the South Pacific. So he set in motion this plan to send these men over by land. The first man to go, the first group to go, was a reconnaissance group led by um, Captain Jim Boyce of Swayze, Indiana. 17 days out, he crossed the mountains and he came to a little mountain village called Jowre. And at Jowre, he radioed back to the division command post that the trail was taxing but practicable. And with that message, MacArthur set in motion his plan. The second group to go, was something called the Miedendorp Patrol, led by Cal Captain Alfred Miedendorp of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And their job was to set up drop sites every three days along this route. 10 days in, Captain Alfred Miedendorp wrote in his diary that New Guinea was nature gone mad. The final group to go, the third group, the second battalion of the 126th Infantry Regiment, the Ghost Mountain Boys, <laughs> began their journey in early October, three weeks into the rainy season. Uh, just as a point of comparison, we all think of maybe New Orleans or Seattle as the rainiest cities in the United States. And those cities get between 60 and 80 inches of rain a year. The Papuan Peninsula of New Guinea gets between two and 300 inches of rain a year. So you can imagine what 800 pairs of boots does to a jungle trail. These men were walking in, in mud initially up to their ankles, then, up to their, then up, to their, up to their shins, and ultimately up to their knees. And it was absolutely excruciating. It was exhausting. And the thing I, I have to mention or emphasize is that these were men in the prime of their lives. They were men, they were products of the Depression. They were no strangers at all to hardship or self-sacrifice. Nevertheless, the trail nearly killed them. Uh, but the misery hadn't even begun yet. About a week in, 10 days in, malaria hit. They'd been exposed to malaria mosquitoes on the coast and the parasite had lodged in their livers and was bursting into their bloodstreams. So 10 days in, they were hiking with 103, 104, and in some cases, 105 degree fevers. A week later, the misery reached its pinnacle. They came down with dysentery. They'd been eating stuff called bully beef, which was canned mutton from Australia, which came in five pound tins. And what happened is the planes would come over and they'd kick out these five pound tins. The planes, by the way, were called bully beef bombers. <laughs> and the, the, the five pound tins of mutton would be scattered all over the jungle. So these men would have to go through the jungle and collect their bully beef. And then, of course, they'd open the bully beef because they were hungry. And it was 95 degrees with 95% humidity. They'd eat it. They'd stick it in their field packs, and a day later, two days later, they'd eat it again because they were starving. And then the dysentery hit, and then, as I said, that's when the misery really, really began. Men, again, 18-year-old men in the prime of their lives, were lying along this jungle trail, which, by the way, was no bigger than a rabbit trail or a deer trail through the woods. And many of them were just lying there and pleading with their buddies not to, not to help them, not to pick them up, but to leave them there, leave them there to die. And of course their buddies didn't. They picked them up and they, and they, and they helped them along. And I should, as one aside, I should make mention of the, the native Papua New Guineans. 300 native Papua New Guineans served as carriers and scouts for the Ghost Mountain Boys, and they call, the Ghost Mountain Boys called them Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. Uh, they were, their hair is kind of in an afro, and the men are about 5'5", five, five, 
130 pounds. They are the most physically adapted people I've ever met in the world. That when we were making our trek, they thought we were mad, white, stumbling giants. They couldn't believe how our lack of agility and our lack of, our lack of um, endurance. And we trained for a year for this trek. But these men would skip through the mountains. Anyway, they helped the 32nd Division. So they would pick up these men and they would carry them. And as Russ says in, in the interview, as the men went along, they thought, I can't continue this. This is just absolutely grueling. So they started chucking stuff out of their field packs. They started doing, chucking out anything they thought might help to lighten their packs. And they ultimately threw out their foul, foul weather gear and their sweaters. Little did they know when they got into the mountains, 10,000 feet, that they'd be caught in these swirling clouds of ice and rain and they'd nearly freeze to death. And so what I'm going to do real quickly is I'm going to read an entry from one of the soldiers' diaries just to give you some notion um, of what they were up against. And he says, You can hardly realize how wild and ghost-like this mountain country is. Almost perpetual rain and steam. We have been traveling all over an almost impassable trail. Our strength is gone. Most of us have dysentery. Boys are falling out and dropping back with fever. Continuous downpour of rain. Bully beef makes us sick. We seem to climb straight up for hours, then down again. God will it never end. Well, ultimately it did end 42 days later. And when it did end, these men went directly into the battle. And as I said, early on, they were physically shattered by the experience. Many of the men lost a third of their body weight. So you can imagine how frail they were. They went in at 180 pounds, and when they reached the north coast, they were 120 pounds, yet they went directly into war. And something else I should mention is, when they got to the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula, they realized that their journey had been in vain. General MacArthur had found usable airfields on the north coast of the Papuan Peninsula and had flown over the rest of the 32nd Division. So he didn't have to send these men over by land. And they were physically shattered by the experience, but as I said, they went directly into the war, into a war that favored the Japanese Imperial Army. They had been there for two months, and up and down this 11-mile front, they'd built hundreds and hundreds of reinforced and interconnected bunkers, and the 32nd Division had nothing to take them out. They had no bazookas. They had no tanks until late into the battle. They had no 105-millimeter howitzers. They had no destroyers off the coast shelling the Japanese positions, so they resorted to what one of my characters called Civil War Tactics. In other words, they rushed the Japanese strongholds and they tried to slip grenades through the firing slot, slits. And the Japanese also occupied all the high ground, so these men were fighting in swamps. So when they'd come out of the swamps and they'd see the high ground and they'd think, hallelujah, we can get out of these fetid swamps, because after walking over the mountains, they had jungle ulcers, I don't know if you know what jungle ulcers, but they're oozing sores. And they had trench foot. So they'd get to the high ground, and then the Japanese machine gunners would just cut them down. So they fled back into the swamps, and that's where they lived and fought and ultimately died. Uh, General MacArthur, however, called them cowards. He said they weren't pushing the battle hard enough. Ultimate, ultimately, he relieved the the general, the, the, um, the, the leading general of the 32nd Division, General Edwin Forrest Harding, and replaced him with General Robert Eichelberger. And what he said to General Eichelberger when he sent General Eichelberger in, he said, take Buna or don't come back alive. And on January 23rd, 1943, the 32nd Division did indeed take Buna although it was a very, very costly war. And I'm going to read some statistics from the book um, that are 
really striking. Um, General Robert Eichelberger wrote a book, and it's called Our Jungle Road to Tokyo. And this is a quote from his book. Buna was bought at a substantial price in death, wounds, disease, despair, and human suffering. No one who fought there, however hard he tries, will ever forget it. And he says, fatalities continued, fatalities closely approach, percentage-wise, the heaviest losses in our own Civil War battles. The 126th Infantry Regiment ceased to exist. The Michigan companies, companies E, F, G, and H, were reduced to mere platoons. And so General MacArthur, I think, was chastened by the, the fatality statistics. And he said, at, after Buna, he said, there will be no more Bunas, no more bloody battles of the, no more head-on battles of the bloody grinding type. And it was after Buna that he developed his much heralded leapfrogging campaign in which he would use the Navy and the Army Air Force to fly north of the Japanese strongholds, cut off their supplies, cut off their medicine, cut off their reinforcements, cut off their food, and let him, let them, the Japanese, as he later said, rot on the vine. But it was Buna that needed, that, that happened um, in order for him to come to that realization or that revelation. And in the process, the casualties at Buna were over 10, were about 10,000. Ninety percent of the men who went to New Guinea ended up as casualties, either battlefield casualties or medical casualties. So after that um, very stark and I guess depressing um, a summary of the book, and it's a, it, it's a depressing and heroic story in so many different ways. What I'd like to do now is show you a video, um, a reel, a nine minute reel to a documentary, as I said, we're still trying to make. In 2008 or nine, I put together a documentary film crew and a small expedition team, and we went to New Guinea to retrace the route of the Ghost Mountain Boys over the mountains. I went over in 2008 and I went over on a, uh, on a research trip and I reconnoitered the trail and I decided that we would attempt to do it. Um, the first day I was carrying a 70 pound pack. I fell 20 feet down the mountain and I tore the anterior cruciate ligament in my knee. I limped out of the jungle, got back to Port Moresby, got anti-inflammatories and painkillers and got helicoptered back out and then we continued. Um, and so you can see that and what I'll try to do after that is tell you just two more minutes of stories about what we encountered and then I'll answer your questions and most importantly these men will answer your questions. This was the hardest thing, this trek was the hardest thing I'd ever done and I've always considered myself kind of a a boots on the ground author for my first book called, this is not a promo for my first book, just to tell you what, oh yeah, microphone, right. Um, so for my first book, it's called The Final Frontiersman. I went and lived in the Arctic off and on for two, two years. My first cousin lives more remotely than any man in North America. He lives 130 miles north of the Arctic Circle and 100 miles from the nearest neighbor. And um, he, he raised, he and his wife raised two daughters in the middle of the bush. He's a hunter, trapper, gatherer. And I lived off and on with him for two years. I lived in a tent at 45 degrees below zero. I walked hundreds of miles on foot and snowshoe uh, in the Arctic. And people always ask me why I decided to do this journey and make this film. And it's because I felt that the whole stories were so horrific and these men had suffered so much, if I was going to write about it, I had to experience it. So maybe you'll experience it too. <laughs> Are we looking good, George? Okay.
In a journey that strained the limits of endurance, James Campbell has rediscovered a nearly forgotten chapter of World War II bravery and suffering. In 2006, the author and adventurer began an extraordinary quest to retrace the path of an American infantry battalion sent on an impossible mission. The soldiers were ordered to march 120 miles over the uncharted mountains of New Guinea. Their journey has been described as one of the cruelest in modern military history. Many of them National Guardsmen from the Midwest, they would endure an incredible test of survival before they even entered combat. Starting from their coastal camp, the soldiers slashed their way through the jungle to a 9,000-foot peak that the natives said was haunted. The soldiers called it Ghost Mountain, and they would become known as the Ghost Mountain Boys. Well, Ghost Mountain, we walked over to Ghost Mountain. There wasn't a bug, fly, or nothing. No, no birds, you know, just weird and eerie. As we went along, and of course, the more burdensome it got, the tired it got, well, you start shedding stuff. And I think when we went over to Ghost Mountain, when I shed everything I had, no need to go over it because I think they had uh, taken what they just so far. Malaria, dysentery, jungle rot, trench foots, and hunger plagued them. And on the other side of the mountains, elite troops of the Japanese Empire waited in their bunkers. The battles on the beaches and in the swamps of New Guinea, sometimes fought hand to hand, were some of the most savage of the South Pacific War. That was 1942. More than a half century later, Campbell began assembling his Ghost Mountain team. Old friend and Chicago-based journalist George Hood agreed to take part, suggesting they collaborate on a documentary. Another friend, Dave Musgrave, a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and an accomplished backpacker, also signed up. I can't imagine doing this. Not knowing what's ahead, having dysentery, malaria, not having the right equipment. Outside magazine photographer Philip Engelhorn became the team's fourth member. Can I go home now? German Piper. <laughs> Engelhorn was based in Hong Kong. I'm tired and I'm hungry. Palm Productions of New Guinea provided the camera crew. The trail boss was Lee Ticehurst, an Australian living in New Guinea and an experienced jungle trekker. Slingshots and spears and the dogs. The dogs are more important than anything else that you can hunt with. These dogs will not bark until they see the game. And then everybody knows it's on. On a hot June day from a high ridge overlooking the Mimoni River, Campbell and his team began their journey. That first day, the expedition nearly collapsed when Campbell fell and re-injured a knee. He was forced to turn back. Tired and dehydrated, Hood also retreated. We're feeling pretty exhausted. It's a tortuous country. Um, I'm 44 years old with a bad wheel. Uh, thought I could do it, and um, it's a killer. We get three days in, we start failing, then what the heck do we do? Plus, we didn't want to slow down the entire group. Rather humiliating, as you might imagine. The rest of the team went on. Back in Fort Moresby, Campbell and Hood regrouped. Four days later, they rejoined the team by helicopter, landing at a village called La Rooney. The team did not travel alone. As the American Army had done, 
The team hired carriers and guides from the villages along the route. Among them was Beirua. As a seven-year-old boy, too frightened to stay behind, Beirua followed his parents as they carried ammunition and supplies for the Americans. Now more than 70, he and his wife Bima would help guide Campbell and his team over Ghost Mountain. Beirua warned Campbell the mountain was haunted by Masawai, evil spirits and demons. Barua told other stories and helped the team find those who knew or remembered the American soldiers. But a bad deliver. Uh, the deliverers are, oh, Jesus help me. Jesus help me. They saw that plane crash. And then they, they start, the troops were moving. The American troops will start moving down to where the plane crashed. Those tales have become part of the local folklore passed down from generation to generation around village campfires. In 1942, the rugged interior of New Guinea was an unmapped wilderness. Sixty-four years later, the team would discover an ecosystem and native people largely unchanged by the passage of time. a land of no roads and long forgotten villages where hunters still use slingshots and spears and have little contacts with the outside world. After more than a month of suffering, the men of the Ghost Mountain Battalion reached the north coast of New Guinea. They went directly into battle, joined by the rest of their 32nd Infantry Division comrades. According to one historian, the combat was a knife fight out of the Stone Age. Though not on a military mission, Gamble's team pushed across New Guinea toward an important goal, to resurrect the story of the Ghost Mountain Boys. It became an ordeal the team could not have imagined, and one it will never forget. <laughs> As I said, I, I kind of fancy myself as a boots-on-the-ground author, um, and, but you see that this, this, this trip nearly undid me. Um, as I said, I, I, spent, I spent two years in the Arctic at 50 Below, walked across the Arctic, but this was clearly the hardest thing I've ever done. And um, the, the one thing I should mention is well, we all ended up with malaria on this trip. We all had jungle ulcers. We all had trench foot. Um, one of the guys, George Hood, my journalist buddy from Chicago, we, there are leeches all over the trail, so you get leeches on you all the time, so you have to get the leeches off. And um, he had an open sore that eventually got infected, and he had a red line shooting up his leg, and we realized that he had, um, he had blood poisoning or septicemia. So, we were about three days away from the coast and we got him to a little mission outpost. And fortunately, a group called Mission Aviation Fellowship flew him out, flew him from this little mountain interior village to Port Moresby. And as soon as he got to Port Moresby, they took him to the hospital. They pumped him full of inter intravenous antibiotics. And the doctor told them that had he waited another day or two, he would have lost his leg. 
But that said, I am in no way at all comparing Sorry about that. No, no way comparing what we did with what they did. Forgive me. This, this always makes me emotional. It was the hardest thing we've ever done, but we had, we did it during the dry season. They did it. They did it during the wet season. We had modern gear, we had modern food, we had maps, we had everything that they didn't. And when we finished, we got to sleep under clean sheets, we got to drink beer, we got to have one hell of a party. And, and we got to celebrate this really small accomplishment and, and we didn't have to go off into war. So that makes all the difference. So thank you. So if you all have any questions, I will attempt to answer them. Uh, forgive me again. I, it's been a long time since I've talked about this book and I thought, it, I'd put enough distance between myself and the story for that not to happen, so my apologies. Um, but I think that, as I said, I always feel sheepish talking about this story in front of the veterans. Um, so if I can answer your questions, I'm happy to. Uh, please direct some questions to them, too. Go ahead. How present was MacArthur on the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, we, the, that, that's a question that will um, that I can treat with a little bit of levity. Um, General MacArthur was well. I should preface this by saying I didn't know. I had no opinion of General. In fact, that's not true. I had a high opinion of General MacArthur before I before I began to write this book. But um, there wasn't one veteran that I interviewed that had a nice thing to say about General MacArthur. While these men were in the swamp, suffering, dying, getting cut, getting, seeing their friends get shot down and getting shot down themselves, General MacArthur was in promenading on his deck in Brisbane, Australia in a pink kimono. <laughs> so that's what he wore. He wore a pink kimono. And um, he never once, never once came to the front. Uh, and later on in a bit of revisionist history, he said that he had not pushed um, the battle in New Guinea, that that was not his intention. But um, perhaps I'm a little bit hard on him, but I do not think, I, I, I think he was a, a man full of egotism and arrogance, and the only thing he wanted to do was record the first land victory of the South Pacific and get back to the Philippines to rescue his reputation. So, thank you. Go ahead. I understand you had modern equipment to. Sorry. I understand you had modern equipment to go across these mountains, and it took the, those mountain boys 14 days. I think you said. 42 days. 42 days. I'm sorry. How yeah. many days did it take you? 21. And um, but of course we weren't we weren't moving we weren't moving a thousand men across the mountains. But um, as I said, I tore my anterior cruciate. In my, in my knee, and anybody who's ever, who's ever had that problem, it's extremely painful. And the Vietnam veterans in the group will understand this. There's no level ground. You go 9,000 feet up. Once you get into the mountains, you go 7,000 feet down. You go 8,000 feet up. You see a little place over there on a ridge, and it's a half a mile, and you think, oh, we'll make it in half a day. You know what? You make it in three days if you're lucky. Uh, that's, how, that's how rugged... That's how rugged the terrain is. And what I did is there was this trail, and it hardly qualifies as a trail, um, that we were on. And I didn't have the use of my knee. So what I'd do is I'd sit down on my backside like a kid going to the water park, like I was down, going down a water slide. 
in, I would sit back and I had two sticks to arrest my, to arrest my fall, and I'd come down, and, and this was on a, you know, a, a, a mud trail, a slippery mud trail, and it was fun for a while, but then the trail would take a turn and I'd go flying off into the jungle and tumbling over, and of course the, 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 the native New Guineans that were with us thought that was the funniest thing in the world, and I'd come out all tangled up, I'd have, I'd have leeches on me and we'd then have to pick off the leeches. Um, but again, I want to say, that, that the native New Guineans are an amazing people and they've never ever gotten official credit for their contribution to the war effort unlike say the Filipino scouts but without their help um, the 32nd division would have had a mighty hard time they also served as stretcher bearers on the coast How large a unit was it the Japanese sent over after them? They sent, they sent over 2,500 men and, I beg your pardon? How many of them came back? And they, they lost 65% they lost of their men going over the mountains and ultimately, um, well, the, the very lurid details, I, I'm not shy about including them in the book, you can read those. They, it, it, was, it was a horrific, they had a horrific um, uh, trek across the mountains too. You made mention that there was no heavy artillery or tanks or things like that with our fellows, but um, and if these guys can tell us, what type of weapons were they carrying? Uh, light infantry weapons, I would suppose, uh, machine guns maybe? What? Russ, did you hear that? They, <clears throat> they asked what type of weapons you use, the average infantryman. Well, they're grand. Yep. 30, 30 caliber yep. grand, semi-automatic, also some of the old um, um, 30, uh, well, 30, well, the bolt action was still some of those, but most of them were the uh, grand semi-automatic. The heaviest weapon? Um, the, the heaviest weapon. Ooh, so was that me? Forgive me. <laughs> was a machine gun, uh, yeah. And um, Russ, was both, Russ was both a cook and a sniper, and he was a, an, a deer hunter from Michigan and one of the sharpshooters in the unit. I forgot I was gonna ask you to do it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say though, uh, we had uh, uh, just the uh, two uh, rifles had the, uh, also had a BAR automatic. Right. Uh, and we had some machine guns, but I don't think ever used any machine guns. Uh, no, no, no mortar fire uh, and hand grenades, and they were dandies. We probably one out of half a dozen work. You could throw a hand grenade and they'd throw it back at me, you throw it back at them. You know, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> they're really, they're really quite an independent, and of course, no flame sword or none of that. So it was mostly just, mostly just rifle fire. I was just wondering, um, the gentleman, he said that. Uh, Native New Guineans never got recognized for the things they did to help. I was wondering, well, did they do to help? Well, they, they, as I said, they, they served as scouts uh, going over the mountains, and um, the, 120, the 2nd Battalion relied on them. Then once they got to the coast, they, by the way, they were called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels for good reason. Uh, the men truly thought they were angels. They served as stretcher bearers on the coast. So when a man got wounded, they'd carry him. They'd go to the front, they'd carry him off the front in mar and, and, and carry them back 13 miles to their base, to their medical base. Um, so Russ, do you have, or Stanley or Carl, anything to say about the native New Guineans, the, the Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels? Well, they're both fantastic people. Like I'm saying that the most uh, fantastic people I could ever meet, uh, like you say, as big as they were, and the loads they would take, I would see sometimes that it would take uh, two days to pick up a packet, a big bale, and put it on another one's back, and away he would go. And I guess he'd probably carry it all day, as far as I know. Yeah. But one of the weirdest things I've seen, and I've told this before, and uh, I've seen it. <laughs> I was in a, in a village one day up here, someplace, and uh, there's a group there, and we walked in with natives, 
And I walked over there, and there was a native lady there nursing a little pig on one breast and a child on the other. It's pretty hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> it was hard to believe, but it was proven since, and there's nothing that other people had seen it. But the pig in, in that country was like having gold. It was a very, very treasure thing to have. So when you stop and think of it, it was probably a choice maybe of the life of a child or a pig. You would always have a kid. <laughs> well, pretty crude, isn't it? <laughs> but it was the truth. Mm -hmm. um, pigs are their prized possessions. In fact, um, men to this day pay bride price. When they get married, they have to pay bride price in pigs to a future wife's family. But also, there's no protein on the island, almost no protein on the island of New Guinea. So occasionally they'll kill pigs when, they're, when, they, when they need protein. But that's true, they do, they, the women did um, breastfeed pigs. I want to say one thing. Um, Russ said they were the most fantastic people. You probably saw the one shot of the woman breastfeeding her child as we were going along. And that's what I mean when, they, when I talked about how incredible these people were. We were struggling up these mountains and they were walking at a you know casual pace. And as I said, we tra I trained for a year for this with an 80 pound backpack. I carried an 80 pound backpack and my daughter was five at the time. I'd put her in a wheelbarrow and she, I'd put a, put a little blanket in the wheelbarrow and she had books on tape or something like that. And I found the steepest hill in, outside Madison, Wisconsin. I had an 80 pound backpack and I'd walk up and down with her for two hours and then I'd, do, and then I'd go run. And so she thinks of it very fondly, <laughs> amazingly. Um, but that's how I trained. And yet when we arrived there, we, we, were, we were nothing compared to these people. Absolutely nothing. Mr. Hamill? Yeah. Uh, we've got about 35 students here enrolled in this class. What advice, what words might you have for students studying uh, World War II history that sometimes might seem so far away? Um, boy. Um, let's see if I can impart some wisdom. Um, I would say if you know anybody who has fought in World War II, um, a neighbor, a relative, go talk to them. Go talk to them. Get their stories. Their stories are, are marvelous. Many of them are wonderful storytellers. And frankly, many of them have, have not really, in many cases, have not really talked about it. So you, you not only do yourselves a favor, in many cases, you'd probably make their day. So. I'm going to guess that there was no compensation to these yeah. uh, natives that were helping uh, so hard. Um, why were they doing it? Did this have the kindness of their heart, boredom of the day? Why were they, why were they so interested in helping? And were others doing the same for the Japanese? Well, it was kind of a political calculation. Um, they, they, at some point, they realized that uh, the United States was going to win the battle and the Japanese weren't. So they chose sides. Some of, the, some of the natives did indeed help the Japanese, and some of them had no choice. Um, and they, in, you know, not to, not to stereotype anybody, but the, the Japanese on the island of New Guinea were considerably more brutal than, than the Americans, and they treated the natives more brutally than the Americans did too. In fact, many of the natives, uh, some of the natives when we were there uh, were still alive, and they talked about their friends, the Americans. Um, so I think, I think it was, they were better treated by the Americans, but also to a certain extent, as I said, a political calculation. The natives were allowed to pick up anything that the soldiers threw away. Yeah, that's right. And, and they still have artifacts in some of the seaside villages, Boone and some, San Ananda, some of the other villages. Um, photos, uh, stuff they found along the trail after, after the men climbing, over, climbing along the Ghost Mountain Trail discarded them. And they are prized possessions. Okay. Oh. I didn't mention the, uh, the, the question, the mountain range that you referred to as the Owen Stanley range. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And these gentlemen over here are they are the heroes. They literally crawled over. We flew over. Yeah. Oh, so you, you, you were part of the 32nd. Well, um, what I should say, as I said, as I said in the beginning, um, the, the men who marched over the mountains suffered monumentally. But any man, and this, and you, you fought obviously in New Guinea, any man who was part of the 32nd Division who fought on the island of New Guinea suffered and suffered a lot. I couldn't help but wonder, um, with your experience and um, an injury in this trek, what type of medical uh, support did these fellows have um, going across? Was it just the medics that normally travel with infantry, or was there, I mean, what kind of medication was available? Well, as I said, they, most of them had no quinine. They were given no quinine when they set out you know, to go to one of the most malarial places in the world. And um, there were medics, but, um, you know, up and down a jungle trail, when, when men are falling, not to use a really crude expression, but when men are falling like flies, you know, the medics didn't know, didn't know who to treat. And frankly, could not have treated the men with malaria. The, the, um, the prescription for malaria was high doses of adabrin, but they didn't get the doses of Adabrin until they came back to Brisbane to recover. So they were not only marching with malaria, they were fighting with malaria and dengue fever, which you probably know is called break bone fever and is very, very painful. And having had malaria and having witnessed my wife on our honeymoon <laughs> suffer from malaria, um, I, it, it's, it's, not, it's nothing pretty. Uh, Mr. Lovell there, one of the veterans with the Red Air Division, served in a hospital unit, and it'd be great for him to comment, I think, on what he saw and observed. And secondly, I'd like to ask all the veterans who are able to respond, what is the most uh, poignant thing they remember? What do they recall uh, from the experience? Thank you. Um, I actually <coughs> was not one of the those mountain boys. I was attached. I was in the 32nd Division in the 107th Medics in the hospital company. And uh, we joined the fray and uh, we landed from Goodenough Island in uh, French Haven on. We were involved. My, my biggest memory is, 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 is the happy, the Drenamore River, uh, where our, our division annihilated the Japanese First Army, as I understand it. Uh, the Japanese were on one side of the river, we were on the other, and it was just a back and forth. Uh, we fired with artillery. Wiped it right off the, the map, practically. Right? <clears throat> uh, I, I was uh, in, the, in the medical supply part of it. I, I was the, actually the, the medical supply sergeant for the 32nd Division. Uh, we were, I was part of the uh, hospital company that we had. Uh, I don't know how many million dollars worth of fire pharmaceuticals that we uh, supplied, obtained and supplied uh, to keep everything going uh, in the medical supplies. Uh, we were, in, like I said, in, in the hospital company. We did we, we Camp Tamarine and Camp Cable. <clears throat> we were receiving casualties from the Luna campaign. Uh, and was, like, like you have explained, it was, it was pretty hard to believe what, what was coming out of there. Uh, well, I got to say that I. I hate to think of going over that mountains again. I always said if I had to go back over the mountains again, I'd rather be shot as every go over the mountains. 